for Googling it was going to be about 700. Uh, and I would say everyone's pretty close. This is kind of like playing the price is right because everyone is, is all in the ballpark. Uh, and uh, Google's initial response was 521. Um, what I would really do though is check with uh, an organization called the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, COSAWIC, mm -hmm. and they would give us the real answer. Um, but I'm not going to well, and whether they and Google is pretty close. This is kind of like playing the price is right because everyone is is all in the ballpark. Oh. Uh, and uh, <laughs> sounds like there's a bit of a lag somewhere. Sarah, you're muted right now, so I don't hear you. I'm not sure if you'd like me to just start my presentation. Oh, uh, oh go sorry. ahead. I'm sorry about that. I was muted and there was some live stream recording going on in the background. It was all <laughs> up in the air here. Thank you. So I checked on the Canadian Wildlife website and you're right. The Google says 500. In Canada, it looks as though there's around 700. But you're, but I mean, always checking with those sources on what the up to date sort of numbers are is, is mm -hmm. crucial. And I mean, seven hundred that seems like so many. Species. It is. Uh, you know, one thing to keep in mind is that there's different levels of threatened. So uh, an endangered species and a threatened species aren't the same thing, and many of them are special concern, which means we really, you know, we need to keep a close eye on these species and we need to be careful with them but they're not at immediate risk of disappearing. Uh, mm. It's really those that are listed as endangered uh, that are a smaller amount. I don't know how many of that 700 um, that are really the ones that are, you know, if we don't do something different uh, soon, we, we stand a good risk of losing them. Wow. That's, yeah, I mean, and that's, that's and losing them, I mean, that's not like losing them and then finding them again. That's like, they they're gone from our ecosystems the, and mm -hmm. the impact of that could be tremendous on not just that animal but on everything that maybe depends on that animal. I, i'm sure you're going to talk about ecosystems so i don't want to take away from your talk <laughs> just right now i don't want to spoil it so mm -hmm. maybe i'll uh, turn it over to you to to introduce yourself uh actually i'm gonna say hi my name is sarah <laughs> and i'm from the center for global education we dove right into the facts there it was so exciting about uh, endangered species day that i forgot to introduce myself and say that i'm joining you from treaty six land here in edmonton alberta and that is land that has been um uh, walked upon and and embraced by the dene nakoto su metis and um, many peoples who have walked this lands before me and so welcome to everyone to this event today uh, celebrating or marking, I don't know if we want to celebrate Endangered Species Day, but we definitely want to think about it and mark it and, and consider our role in helping to maybe eliminate that 700 down to, to a, a, a much more less number <laughs> of endangered species. So Nick, I'd like to invite you to introduce yourself and, and where you're joining us from and, and, and tell us a bit about your role at CWF and get us started on the day. Yeah, sounds good. So I'm a biologist. I live in Ottawa and uh, I lead uh, Canadian Wildlife Federation's freshwater conservation program. Uh, I mostly focus on fish. That's uh, my biggest interest and my, my uh, educational background with studying fish, uh, fishery science. Uh, and I focus on freshwater fish. Uh, so those that live in freshwater for all or part of their life cycle. Uh, and I knew I wanted to live in Ottawa and we're pretty far from the ocean. So uh, studying freshwater fish was important uh, rather than, than marine fish. Uh, but American eel is one of those exceptions and it's the species I'd like to talk about today. And that's a species that even as far inland as Ottawa uh, is actually connected to the ocean and spends part of its life in the ocean and part of its life in freshwater. Um, so if you'd like, I could uh, share my screen and start uh, with that presentation. That would be wonderful. Please do. Okay. Uh, right now, uh, host is disabled participant screen oh, sharing, so you may need I'm to invite me to I'm going to make so. you a host. Mm -hmm. We are just negotiating that here mm -hmm. on the back end. And here you are. All right. Uh, let's see. And as okay. we're... 
as we're getting set up, as you're coming in online, if you want to change your name so that it says who you are and where you're from. I noticed we just had someone join us from Bangladesh. So awesome. Welcome. So you can also put your name. So I have, I'll put mine to Sarah and then Edmonton, Canada. And so to do that, you go to the participants, you find your name, and then you just can rename yourself. So over to you, Nick. I Perfect. see your name. Yeah. Uh, so as I said, I'm going to talk today about American Eel. Here's a picture of, uh, of one of these. And this is a really, really unique species in Eastern North America. They're found all the way from Iceland and Greenland uh, down to Venezuela. Uh, so they're a really widespread species, a, a completely original and unique species. And as much as they look a bit like a snake, they are purely a fish. And you can tell they're a fish because they have gills, they have fins and a tail, uh, and they have a jaw. So they're a part of the bony fish uh, group of fish. Um, and they have very, very tiny, tiny scales. They, their skin feels uh, essentially like, uh, it's actually a little rougher. It looks fairly smooth. Um, they are a very, very slimy fish uh, among the slimiest that I know. Uh, but for the most part, no one ever touches an eel unless you happen to catch one by mistake or you're out uh, looking to harvest eels, depending on what part of the world you're in. Um, eels are very, very shy creatures. So if you're swimming in waters that have eels, you don't have to worry one little bit about an eel coming up and, and biting you or anything like that. Uh, if an eel sees you swimming nearby, it's going to run and hide. So uh, really nothing to be afraid of with these fish. And um, some people who don't like snakes uh, don't like the looks of eels, but I think they're really, really uh, unique, interesting looking. I think they're, they're beautiful. They have neat colors and their faces are, are pretty cute. Um, and I even uh, had an American eel as a pet uh, when I lived in Virginia and I was uh, doing my graduate studies there for four years. I had an aquarium uh, and had an eel that I almost never saw because of... Uh, Hello. Oh, my. Oh, we lost you there for a minute. <laughs> yes. um, but you're back. Now, for this pet, were you able to, to pet it? Or was it uh, more just a. No, not really. Just like most fish pets, uh, they're uh, not ones that you handle typically. And in fact, fish don't do really well from being handled. They have uh, a part of the reason that eels are so slimy is that all fish have a protective mucus layer uh, that helps them to swim through the water very easily and protects them from infection. And usually if you touch a fish, you take away that layer, it sticks to your hand, and then the fish doesn't end up being as healthy. So it's not really a good idea to handle fish. Um, sometimes when you're fishing and you're going to release a fish, you have to handle a fish. Uh, and in that situation, the best thing you can do is wet your hands first to pick up a fish. Uh, or if a fish is on shore and you wanna throw it back in, make sure you wet your hands before you touch them. Uh, but they're not typically uh, like a cat oh, or a dog, a type of animal that likes okay. to be pet. We just have people logging in and just remember everyone to keep your microphone muted. And if I mute you, you don't unmute yourself. I see someone keeps unmuting them. All right, back over to you, Nick. Great. So I just stopped my slideshow because these uh, words weren't appearing um, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on them. But what's really unique about American eel is, is they're a type of fish that, as I said earlier, migrates between freshwater and saltwater. So they're a diadromous fish, um, but there are a couple of types of diadromous fish. And the one that most people are really familiar with is anadromous fish. These would be salmon and herring. And salmon, as I'm sure many of you know, spend most of their life in the ocean. And then when they're adults, they come uh, inland, they swim up rivers, lay their eggs in fresh water, and the babies hatch in fresh water and swim back out to the ocean uh, while they're still young and grow up there. And there are several types of anadromous fish in North America, but there's only one catadromous fish, which is the American eel, and they have the exact opposite life cycle. Uh, they lay their eggs way out in the ocean, and the little baby eels drift until they hit the side of the, of the continent. And then they start swimming upstream and they spend most of their lives growing up in freshwater. So they're basically like opposite salmon uh, and have a pretty unique uh, history because of that. Now someone on the, has a question if, if they can be eaten. 
Eels can definitely be eaten. Uh, they're a really popular food fish throughout human history. Um, they're more popular in Europe and especially in Asia than they are in North America today. Uh, but if you've ever gone for sushi and had unagi, uh, it's a little slice of smoked eel. Um, and they're a very oily fish, which makes them a really good fish for smoking. So smoked eel is the, the most common way to eat them. Uh, and certainly here in North America, indigenous people uh, ate American eel as one of their most important food sources, depending on where they were, uh, and would preserve them by smoking them. So smoking fish uh, is really good for the flavor, and it also preserves them. Uh, and so eel, because they're an oily fish that smokes really well, are a really good fish to smoke and store for long periods of time. Um, but uh, because many of the eel species are, are really declining in abundance and are uh, either special concern, threatened, or endangered, uh, there's far less uh, eel being eaten today than there has been in the past. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so now I can go back to my slideshow. So uh, what, uh, let's see, here we go. So this is the life cycle of American eel. So, uh, and they have different, they're a unique species, almost like an insect in that they have different unique names uh, for their different life stages. And I'm gonna show you what these life stages look like and uh, where they're found in relation to, to the ocean using Ottawa as an example. Um, and so their life cycle starts when these big silver eels uh, are go out to the ocean to spawn. You can see here, there's a big fat female, a, a huge American eel female might weigh about seven kilograms and could have millions and millions of eggs uh, in her belly. So she's a super important part of this, uh, this population. And so they go out and they swim all the way out to the ocean, the American eel and the European eel both spawn in the Sargasso Sea, which is a part of the Atlantic Ocean down near Bermuda, uh, just off, well, well off the coast of Florida. And uh, in this big Sargasso Sea, one of the great mysteries of American eel is we still don't know where in this big sea they actually spawn. Uh, no human has ever seen or videotaped an eel spawning or found eel eggs out in the wild. Uh, all that we know is that the, the adults that we've tracked disappear somewhere here and this is where we start to see the uh, the larva the leptocephali appear when they first uh, show up in the ocean um, in in the fall uh, so there's a great mystery around American eels they're one of the most mysterious fish that we have and uh, the more we study them the more we find out we don't know about them uh, so here we have where I am in Ottawa where it is one of the parts of, of where American eel go and this is where they spawn and that's a trip of about 3,500 kilometers, maybe a bit longer. So these are big, big swimmers. And really only the big females can make these long distances. So here in Ontario, we only ever have female American eels and they're among the biggest in the world. They can be over a meter long. Uh, so huge, huge uh, American eels. Uh, and the male eels typically are found much closer to the coast. Uh, and they don't swim as far and they don't have to carry those big eggs. So the big females can live 20 years or more. The males mature and swim back out at about five to seven years old. So uh, after these eggs are laid, we then have these lepto, uh, a single one is called a leptocephalus. When there's many of them, they're leptocephali. And this is what they look like. Uh, they're very tiny. They're probably less than a centimeter long and they kind of look like leaves. And the reason they look like leaves is that they're trying to catch those ocean currents and being pushed along. They're just feeding on plankton, little tiny organisms that, that come by them as they drift through the ocean. And they're trying to drift and spread out from Greenland all the way down to, to Venezuela. And this is where they start to get picked up just at the edge of the Sargasso Sea. They then become glass eels and they become glass eels when they hit the continental shelf here. Uh, so as soon as they start to come inland, they turn uh, into much longer organisms. They start to look like little eels, uh, but they're crystal clear. And that's where they get that term glass eels. As they move in a little more uh, into fresh water, they start to darken and they get this term. Uh, they, they get to be called elvers in French. It's civelle. It's a very uh, pretty name for them. And these little tiny eels are incredible climbers. They have to be great climbers because 
naturally they would have to get over rapids. You know, these are eels that are trying to get to their habitat in fresh water and they have a lot of obstacles to get around. So when an eel is less than about 10 centimeters, so, uh, you know, about uh, four to six inches, uh, they can actually stick to vertical concrete surfaces as long as those surfaces are wet and climb straight up them um, just because they're so light. So here's a picture of eels getting around a human obstacle. Um, but by the time they get bigger than that, they're not able to. They'll still go up on wet shorelines uh, and crawl through the forest to get around just, you know, along the edge of a stream to get around a set of rapids. Um, but they won't go up and, and uh, you know, play around on land uh, for any other reason than to get, uh, to get around obstacles. When they get a little bit bigger, they become yellow eels. And this is basically when they've reached the habitat that they're going to stay in for the next five to 20 years. Um, and uh, they're a little bigger then. They, they can, you know, both male and females look like that. They're called yellow eels because they kind of have a yellowish to a brownish to a greenish color. Um, uh, usually sort of, or, you know, sort of brownish green would be my description, but it depends on where you're, you're found. Uh, and they keep that color right up until the point that they mature. When they mature, they become silver eels. And if you actually hold the two next to each other, the silver eels really have lost all of that brownish, greenish, yellowish color, and they're, they're gray to silver. And that's a, that's a mature eel that has started to turn that color because they're moving back out to the ocean. Uh, they're on their way out. And so that happens at the, the end of their life cycle. And these eels, once they turn silver and go back out to the ocean, they only have one chance to make it back to the ocean to spawn. Uh, they'll spawn once and then they'll die. Uh, like most of our Pacific salmon, in contrast, the Atlantic salmon in uh, Eastern North America can spawn multiple times and then swim back out to the ocean to, to come back and spawn another year. Now, uh, one of our participants is wondering if they can harm people. Do eels harm people? In, in, during the swimming or in there, any yeah, other stages? Not in any way, shape or form. The one eel that could be harmful to people is the electric eel, but they're only found in South America and they're not even, they're, they're not even really a, a close cousin of the American eel. Uh, so the American eel, uh, the European eel and the short fin and long fin eels in the, in the Pacific Ocean are all completely harmless to people. Uh, they don't even really have big teeth and they're quite scared of people. Uh, so there's zero, really zero way that an eel could ever harm a person. Even, you know, even if you try to pick it up, uh, mm -hmm. you, you, uh, it wouldn't hurt you. And in fact, you really can't hold on to them. They're so uh, strong and slippery and squirmy uh, that they just squirm right out of your hands and, and get away uh, right away. And then someone else asked, they might have missed it if you said it, but how long does that journey, that swimming journey take? Because that's the yeah. long route. Yeah, I mean, again, if you're, if you're an eel that lives by the coast down in Virginia, um, that might not take all that long. But for eels, and you, you know, they might leave in, um, in December or, or January to get to the spawning grounds to spawn in the spring. Uh, our eels here in... Uh, in Ottawa and Lake Ontario, the, some of the more inland eels take a long time to get there and they have to actually leave between July and September to catch up to those eels that are leaving from the coast and to get there on time. Uh, and I mean, these eels are good swimmers. Someone had asked how fast they can swim at the start mm -hmm. of the call. Uh, mm -hmm. We know they can swim um, about one meter per second, but over the course of it, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean a lot, over the course of a full day of traveling, an out migrating eel can swim 50 kilometers a day. 50 uh, kilometers? Down, down the St. Lawrence River. They're to so get, small, though. Well, a big eel is, you know, uh, a meter long. And at oh. night, uh, we know that uh, once they get out into the ocean, they will swim a half a kilometer, 500 meters every day up and down. So during the nighttime, they'll come up close to the surface. And then during the daytime, they'll dive down deep. They'll dive down 500 meters, a half a kilometer under the water. To continue their migration and they're probably doing that to avoid predators like poor beagle, beagle sharks that would be present in the upper part of the water column so not only are they swimming out they're also every day swimming way up and way down when they get to the ocean uh, as they're making their way out to their spawning grounds awesome mm -hmm. all right we'll we'll get you there's some more questions but i'll weave them in as we go sounds good 
So here is the habitat that eels like to use for most of their life. And this is why you really don't have to be afraid of eels because they are way more afraid of you. Uh, during the day, they like to burrow. Uh, they'll burrow in mud, in sand. This is what my pet eel would have looked like. I hardly ever saw my pet eel because he was always hidden in the sand of my aquarium. Uh, uh, in vegetation here, uh, if there's big bouldery areas, they'll go and hide under the boulders and uh, they might come out a bit more at night to, to feed, but for the most part, and if anyone comes anywhere close to them, they're going to zip into some hole somewhere and hide. Uh, and they're really good at burying themselves. This is something you see a lot in marine fish, but there's not a lot of freshwater fish that dig into the substrate like eels do. Uh, I'm not sure where this picture was taken, and my suspicion is that this is somewhere in Australia or New Zealand with a short finned or long finned eel. That's a species that's in the same genus as American eel. They're very, very closely related. They're like a brother or sister to American eel. Uh, and these are ones that have probably been trained to eat food from humans, but you can see they're not really that afraid to get into shallow water or even to come out of water for food a little bit. And mm -hmm. there is anecdotes when there used to be uh, abundant eels in, in Ontario of eels going into pea fields uh, in rainy nights to go feed on earthworms. Uh, and I don't have any confirmation of that, but I'm, I'm, uh, you know, reasonably willing, I'm a little skeptical, but reasonably willing to believe that eels uh, used to do that um, because they're so able to live outside of water. Now, the trick about eels, though they're really good climbers, as I said before, even adult eels are good at climbing up and down hills, you know, they just can't climb vertical surfaces. The thing about American eels is they have to stay wet. So you're not going to see an American eel come out of the water on a dry surface uh, or out in the sun. Uh, they would dry out very quickly on a hot sunny day. So they're not able to survive there. Um, and they're not air breathers like some other fish. So they do still, you know, they can hold their breath a long time. They can still get a bit of oxygen exchange through their gills if their gills are wet or damp and through their skin, but they can't live for long periods of time out of the water. They really are a freshwater organism. Not like a salamander well, or something. Someone's, yeah, someone's asked, why are they the color that they are? And does that have something to do with being in the water and staying warm or what? Yeah, uh, well, usually the color is to avoid predators, right? Okay. So most fish are dark on top and light on the bottom. And this is because mm -hmm. if they are underneath things, they want to blend in with the substrate, the bottom of the river or lake bottom, so mm -hmm. that birds and other fish that are swimming above them don't see them. And if they're up high and there's fish swimming along, along below them, they have a white belly and that's so that they blend in with the sky and they're not as easy to spot. Uh, but those, those brownish yellowish colors uh, are sort of how, so that they blend in with those, the typical freshwater colors of brown, green, uh, you know, that, that sort of thing. Uh, likely they turn silver because if you get into the ocean, uh, that water's a bit more clear. And if you see a lot of the the pelagic fish, the fish that swim out in the middle of the ocean, they tend to be silver or blue and not so much brown or, or green like freshwater fish. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the questions are just coming and coming. And I see your next one is, is probably about eels eating since this lady is feeding something them off a popsicle stick, like a shish kebab almost. Yeah, but, that's right. But there's a lot of questions, three or four, about what do they eat and do they have teeth to do this eating? They have little tiny teeth. Um, you know, they're not a species that I would uh, stick my hand in and lift them up by the jaw because okay. um, I might get, uh, you know, like little needle holes in my thumb, but they're also not a species that could take a chunk, uh, you know, bite my thumb off or take a <laughs> chunk out of my arm. So their teeth aren't so much for chewing or biting pieces off of things, their teeth for holding on to, to something once it gets into their mouth. Uh -huh. uh, so American eel because they spend so much time down in the mud or under rocks or so on, they like to feed on insects and crayfish. And crayfish in particular is probably their favorite food fish, uh, you know, because they're really a perfect crayfish predator. Uh, they, they don't have to leave their substrate to get a hold of them. They can dig their head under rocks where the crayfish like to hide. And in fact, uh, I was talking to some biologists in Toronto Harbor and they said that they were starting to see eels in Toronto Harbor for the first time in, in many years. And I commented on, on uh, you know, the fact that they like to eat crayfish and they said, oh yeah, we've also seen a lot more crayfish 
in Toronto Harbour in recent years. So the eels might be going back into Toronto Harbour because of that food source that's available to them. Um, as they get bigger, they do start to eat other fish, but they don't eat, you know, the big sport fish that we like to go after, like the bass and the walleye, because uh, those fish are just way too big for the, the tiny little neck that an eel has. Uh, they would typically eat smaller minnows or, or young fish uh, when they do eat fish. And so we talked a little bit about Indigenous people eating eels, but here in the Ottawa area and a lot, uh, you know, up and down the coast, the eastern coast of North America, American eel were a really important fish and not just for food. Uh, their skin has a really interesting property where uh, as it dries, it tightens up and, and shrinks. And so, you know, it was almost like uh, a plastic before people had plastics, they could use it to, to tie snowshoes and make grips for their bows because you could tie it around the bowstring and then when it dried, it would tighten up almost like a glue. And what was really neat about them is then once they've tightened up like that, if you wet them again, they can, uh, they can expand. So it was really good for making casts or braces, you know, for people who had to, you know, uh, there's even a local uh, person, part of the Algonquins of Ontario, who had an old uh, chainsaw wound that would cause him a lot of ar arthritis pain. And so he would keep an eel skin that he would wrap around and let dry over his wrist to help uh, ease that pain. Uh, so they were, you know, that skin was important for both tools and for, uh, for medicine. Uh, so they were a really, really vital, uh, vital species. And they were harvested uh, through pot traps like this uh, by spear fishing at night, people would go out with a torch on a, on a canoe and spear these eels, uh, even up to a thousand eels a night when they were out migrating because they were so abundant. Uh, or people would build a weir, this, this sort of V-shaped rock wall that would herd those eels as they out migrated down to the bottom where they could either be caught in a trap like this or speared. Um, so historically, they weren't caught so much by hook and line, but by trapping and spearing. And so, you know, because we're talking about uh, endangered species today on, in uh, recognition of, of uh, Endangered Species Day, American eel are one of those species. And their status kind of depends on where you go. So if you go out to the Maritimes and, and Newfoundland, there are still lots and lots of eels on, in a lot of those rivers. Um, and so, and in the U.S. as well, many of those coastal rivers. So they're not recognized as endangered everywhere. Uh, Canada-wide, they're considered threatened. Um, globally, the global um, biologists who have reviewed them would consider them endangered. And here in Ontario, you know, they're, they're considered endangered as well. And in most cases, you know, over-harvest can be a problem. We're not sure how climate change is affecting the species or contaminants or some of those other issues. But the biggest issue facing American eels, uh, without question, is dams, and in particular, hydro dams. And the reason that dams are such a big issue for American eel is that these eels need to move between fresh water and the ocean. And a dam creates a major barrier that eels just can't get around. You know, I said before that eels are good climbers, but when they hit a huge concrete dam that goes from shoreline to shoreline and is 100 feet tall, that is not something that an eel can get around. Um, and so it keeps those baby eels from getting in and colonizing their the habitat and getting to the habitat where they need to grow, or it cuts them off. It cuts off most of their habitat that they would normally be able to access. Um, some of these dams have ways to get around them. There's a very, very few, you know, probably less than 1% of these dams have an eel ladder that eels can climb to get over the dam. And that yeah. helps the, the baby eels get past. Sometimes there's a lock system to get boats around a dam and eels can make use of that. So still some eels make it around some of these dams, uh, but if they do, the problem is they still have to come back downstream. And that's a really dangerous thing because by the time they come back downstream, they're these big, uh, big female eels full of eggs. They're super long and they have to make it down through the turbines. And unfortunately those turbines, uh, eels don't know how to avoid them. The, the turbines carry most of the flow of the river down through those turbines. And so the eels have no choice to go down through them. And if they're really lucky, they can ball up and get through a turbine unscathed. And if they're not unlucky, then they get hit by the blade of the turbine or cut up or so on. And so each dam might kill 20 to 50% of the eels that try to make it down through there. Goodness. And so, you know, you can see here what this graph shows 
is over time, it shows how the number of eels changes. And this is the number of eels on the St. Lawrence River swimming up. These are the baby eels that are swimming up from the St. Lawrence River and climbing over a ladder that was installed on a dam called the Moses Saunders Dam that's pictured here uh, way back in 1974. Mm. You can see each year, this is the count of the number of eels that made it up that ladder. It's one of the best long-term data sets we have on the number of eels that are present. And so in the late 1970s, all the way until the mid 1980s, we had, you know, about 800,000 eels a year, sometimes more, sometimes uh, 1.3 million, sometimes less, a few hundred thousand. But basically on average, we had 800,000 baby eels making it up that ladder every year until about 1985 and then those numbers dropped off and today we have less than 10,000 eels making it up that ladder every year so we've really uh you know so we basically have less than one percent of the eels in Ontario that we used to have they used to be a really uh abundant species there used to be a commercial fishery for them in Lake Ontario that's been shut down and unfortunately other than a few ladders and one example on the Ottawa River um very little has been done to help these eels uh, get around these hydro dams. So this has been a problem that we've known since for, you know, more than 20 years now, since the 1990s, we've seen, we've identified this decline in eels in freshwater systems and known that dams are an issue for that. And those dam owners and power producers have done damn little about the harm that their uh, facilities are causing to American eel. Um, some of them are trying, They're, they are taking baby steps, but it really has not been enough to help those eels recover or even to stop the, the really uh, alarming decline that we've seen in American eel. So Marge in Edmonton is asking, do we need, is the answer more ladders or is it like a systemic sort of, like at this point, Yeah. you know, like when you're so low, what do we need to to bounce them back up. Yeah, more ladders would help, um, especially you know when you've got a river system that has five or six dams on it. We don't necessarily want to get eels all the way up to, to the top of that system right now because the eels that make it all the way to the top have to then go back down through six dams, and at each dam they have a chance of getting killed. But eels that go above one or two dams, you know, the majority of eels are still going to make it out through those dams alive. And if you think about what I said earlier, that these eels take 20 years to mature, well, if we can put ladders in today, that gives those dam owners 20 years to come up with solutions to get those eels safely back through the dam. So the argument that the, the power producers say is we don't want to put these ladders in because we don't want to doom these eels by getting them above dams where they're going to have to come back down through the turbine. And my argument is, does that mean you're not planning on doing anything about this turbine issue for 20 years? And that to yeah. me is, you know, when you're dealing with an endangered species, that's not acceptable. So yes, we need more ladders, uh, not at every dam, but we need to increase the number of dams that have ladders. We need to do research to get better at uh, building those ladders so that they move, you know, they're easier for eels to find and climb. And we need to do work to get eels safely uh, around these turbines. And the thing we can do right now that is actually really easy that um, few, if any, power producers are doing is there, there's a one neat little thing. When you learn about the biology of these species, you can find solutions. And it turns out, like I said earlier, that eels like to come out at night to feed. Well, mm -hmm. it turns out they also like to migrate at night. And about 75% of the movement that they do is at night. And they only out migrate over about a two to three month period during the summer. So if we shut off uh, turbines and sent water over spillways uh, at night for during the eel migration season, we could save 75% of the eels that were going over those dams. They would have a safe way around those dams. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that nighttime is when we need the least electricity. Everyone's asleep. Our lights are off. We're not watching our TVs or running our appliances. So uh, it's not really a critical time for power production as well. So that's a trade-off that we could make over the short term while we develop better solutions, better technologies for getting eels safely around turbines. Uh, so there's a lot of things we could be doing right away. Mm -hmm. So Amaya has a question that she's asked a few times, and I think it's a good time to ask it now. And then there's another question from sure. Grace. So two questions. One is how many, um, like how many uh, of the little tiny guys actually make it? 
So of the, mm. are they aren't larva. <laughs> I forgot Le the Le Leptocephali. Yes, of those, how many actually make it to being full grown eels? Yeah, we, we really don't know, right? Um, it's, it's one of those things that's so hard. I mean, generally with fish like that, that have millions of eggs, uh, you're, you're sort of lucky to get one out of a million survive to return to spawn. And really, if each adult uh, reproduces, you know, even if they lay 20 million eggs, as long as at least two of those come back and, and survive, you're doing all right. Mm -hmm. um, but that's probably it. It's probably around one in a million. And so, uh, you know, the biggest female maybe would get up to 20 million eggs, could actually produce a lot of other adult eels uh, to mm -hmm. replace herself. And, you know, in a situation where these populations are so depleted, uh, if there weren't a lot of dams there, then uh, there's a lot of room for uh, more of those fish to survive because there's not as much competition. You know, they, they all have a lot of access to crayfish food. So a lot more of them can grow big and grow more quickly. And we are actually seeing that right now with Lake Ontario eels. They're actually growing so fast now that they're maturing in 10 to 12 years compared to 20 years old. That mm -hmm. might be because there's fewer eels. It might also be because of the way the Lake Ontario ecosystem has changed and the food sources that are available to them now that didn't used to be available to them. But that's a whole other story. <laughs> yeah. All right. So from Grace, she's wondering, can you sort of explain what these ladders actually look like? Yeah, they well. Like, they can't uh, look like real ladders with rungs. No, they're not ladders with rungs. It's almost like a slide. It's almost uh, maybe more like a rock wall. And in this case, oh. it would be a slide with a whole bunch of little... Um, knobs or circular pipes put into it and I don't know I have a picture of a ladder trap that sort of simulates a ladder but I don't know if it shows these little pipes but basically if you've seen like a Plinko game where there's a whole bunch of little paths that they can go down mm -hmm. when so when you put a whole bunch of little tubes like that what the eels can do is even if they're going up a very steep ladder like this they can push in and around each of those tubes and use them to climb to get above the ladder. Uh, mm -hmm. And what's really important about these ladders is you have to pump water down them. So water is flowing down them, just like down a water slide. Um, and that helps uh, not only keep the, the whole surface wet that allows these eels to move, but it allows you need to pump enough water over the slide that, that they can breathe as they're climbing it, because climbing is, is really physically exerting for these eels. Mm -hmm. um, and you need to have enough water falling down off that ladder that it attracts the eels. And this is the hardest thing is to convince the eels that this crazy ladder thing is something that's going to lead them up and over the obstacle that they're trying to get around. Oh, I can there's, imagine. Years of, you know, natural selection has not told them about ladders. No, but, you know, that, that natural selection has taught them how to get over rapids and small waterfalls, mm -hmm. and it's taught them to explore every nook and cranny. So we're in a bit more of an advantage with eels than with salmon because salmon need deeper water. They need to be able to jump. You know, they do explore rapids to find a way around, but they're typically exploring the areas that have the most flow. Whereas eels might be looking for side routes uh, that wouldn't be available to other fish. So, um, but we haven't done a really good job of um, finding out what proportion of eels that approach a dam with a ladder actually finds that ladder and, and makes it over. We've done a good job knowing that when eels get onto a ladder like that, even like this ladder in particular at the Moses Saunders Dam, we know that 80 or 90% of them make it up and over the top. Um, but we don't really know, you know, of all the eels that are stacking up at the bottom, how many make it into the ladder. Oh, we have lots of people with eager questions to ask you. Mm. Um, so do you mind if I ask a few questions before we move on? Sure, absolutely. Okay, so... Oh, there's been a few times people have asked how and when were eels even first discovered? Do we know this? I mean, they've been around longer than we have. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, by the time the first humans came to North America uh, and came to the banks of the Ottawa River, the Delaware River, the Potomac Nature. River, you know, you name it, uh, they would have found these eels. And, and those eels would have been uh, a big reason why those people could stick around. I mean, Ottawa is where it is because of the Chaudière Rapids that were a great place for uh, the Anishinaabe people to meet uh, for years. This was a, a traditional meeting grounds uh, at a time that would coincide with the eel migration because there was this big food source that was consistently available that would be out migrating 
uh, during the summer months when those people would travel to meet uh, where Ottawa is today. Mm. Awesome. And I mean, and that sort of goes to show the historic, like indigenous peoples use these animals as they use other creatures to, mm -hmm. within their cultures for different use. I really love that slide on, I mean, what was their purpose? How were they used by, by within that sort of, and we do have an ecosystem question in that people want someone, um, Yamilek asked what, what would happen if they stopped existing? Like what is their role in the ecosystem? Yeah. Uh, well, again, that's not well understood and, um, you know, essentially, this is the thing about an endangered species is when a when a species gets to be so rare, when it was once really abundant, when you once had, you know, um, millions of eels in Lake Ontario, and now you have, you know, uh, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. Um, they're so rare now compared to how abundant they were that they've, from an ecosystem perspective, they almost don't exist. Uh, mm -hmm. And they no longer play the role that they did when they were that abundant. And unfortunately, you know, because eels have been declining and disappearing since we put these dams in, uh, you know, going back to around 1900 all the way up to about 1960, um, we didn't have really good records of, of what the freshwater fish communities looked like uh, when there were many eels. Um, what we know today about the Ottawa River is that a huge proportion of the Ottawa River uh, biomass is channel catfish. Like in, in many studies, 80% of the fish weight of the Ottawa River is channel catfish. And the Ottawa River has 90 different species in it. So we don't know if those channel catfish are super abundant, you know, because eels have declined in abundance. And now there's not that competitor with channel catfish that also live near the bottom to keep those channel catfish in check, uh, or we don't, or ch channel catfish may have always been uh, really abundant. Um, hmm. And we also don't know what this change has had on ocean ecosystems, um, where the decline in these, these fish that would have fed poor beagle sharks and whose eggs and, and larvae would have fed, fed organisms as well. Um, so there's just, you know, ecosystems are really complex and really hard to study. Yeah. Uh, and it's really hard to predict what a huge change in a really important species like this will have. All right. Now, before we have 15 minutes, and I know lots of questions from our from our youth that are here. But mm -hmm. before you move on to your your last few slides, uh, Ayan had a good question that takes us kind of right back to the beginning. Um, it, for those who aren't familiar with eels, but um, she says that you know they look like snakes. Mm -hmm. What makes an eel an eel? Uh, so like I said, eels are fish, and, and the mm. biggest distinction between an eel and a snake is that uh, eels have gills and can breathe underwater and have to breathe underwater. So the gills is a major distinction. The other really big distinction is the fins. Uh, mm -hmm. Snakes don't have fins, but eels, like a fish, have their uh, pectoral fins here on the side of their, uh, their arms, mm -hmm. and they have a tail fin, which is called the, the caudal fin. And in fact, eels are a really unique fish because they have a dorsal fin on their back and an anal fin, which is the fin found uh, behind their, their uh, cloaca or their bum. And eels, anal fin, caudal fin, and uh, dorsal fin are all fused into one. It's a long fin that goes all the way around the top, back, and bottom of the eel. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to let you get through these slides because we got lots to learn. No problem. So I just have a few slides on some of the research that we've been doing here on the Ottawa River, and uh, I'm happy to show those. I'm happy to take questions. Uh, right. We'll just go as, as we do. Sure. Uh, I might try to jump ahead at some point to the last couple of slides about uh, one particular research project that I think is really interesting. Um, so we have tracked eels using radio telemetry. We've trapped them. Here you can see people doing surgery on an eel, to uh, an unconscious eel, to implant a radio tag in them. And then you can track those eels with this big antenna or by mounting that antenna on a plane and flying around to see where they move. We've, these are the eel ladder traps. And like I say, it doesn't, uh, you can't actually see the pegs in the ladder trap because we've covered it up with a board so that they can basically travel up through this tunnel where raccoons and, and eagles or osprey can't come and eat them and where they feel safe. Um, but we can use this so basically an eel would enter the trap up here, climb up to the top, and then end up, instead of going up and over the obstacle, in a bucket that we have that is filled with running water. Um, so we can use that for research as well. 
And we've also used a different type of tracking, which is acoustic telemetry. So this is very similar to the radio tracking. We would implant a tiny little tag like this. Uh, some are a bit bigger in an American eel and then put these uh, receivers out to listen when those eels come close. And the difference with acoustic and radio is radio, you can hear these eels with those antennas and typically you can uh, listen to those fish, listen for those fish that you've tied yeah. in the water. Uh, with acoustic telemetry, you only listen to those fish underwater, um, but you can deploy a whole bunch of these receivers. And the way we do that is we put some kind of anchor down, we we put a float and this float would be under the water. So this would be about uh, two meters or about as tall as I am. Um, and in between on that cord, we'd attach this receiver. And then if that eel comes within about a half a kilometer of that receiver, uh, its tag would ping and this receiver would hear that ping and would record the time and the, the identity of that eel that, uh, that approached. And so this is a map of the spot that I was talking about earlier. This is Chaudière Falls in downtown Ottawa. Uh, this right over here is the Parliament buildings. Can you guys see the mouse on my screen? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so I think you're seeing my, uh, you're not seeing my slideshow, but <laughs> the slideshow that I'm seeing, mm -hmm. that's okay. So these are, uh, uh, sorry, these, I think the Parliament buildings are just off screen here, um, but this is right, right close to downtown Ottawa. And there's a big uh, waterfall here, this big ring dam. And historically, these were called the Chaudière Falls. They were, uh, you know, one of the most beautiful falls in the world. Um, not, not as big as Niagara, but, uh, you know, high on the list in terms of that size. And for a long time, they've been changed into, at first, a dam to, to deal with um, flour mills and pulp and paper mills and to deal with all the lumber that was coming down the Ottawa River. And then starting around the 1900s, these became uh, a hydro dam. And in fact, there was one time where during the eel out migration se uh, season, one of the big turbines jammed shut and they opened it up to see why it had jammed shut. And it was filled with so many dead eels uh, that the eels had actually stopped and seized the turbine. Um, wow. And this is a really unique spot because those falls still provide safe passage to the eels but each of these other channels that you see has a set of turbines on it. And so this gave us a chance to see what do eels do when they approach a hydro dam like this, which route do they select and do they survive when they go downstream? And so all of these receivers above the dam uh, all talk to each other and they can triangulate and tell us exactly where an eel was as it came and passed through this uh, environment each time that the eel pinged. And then in purple, this is all downstream of the dam they can't tell us exactly where the eel was, but they can tell us whether the eel came through each of these routes. Hmm. Wow. And so these are the traces of seven of the eels that we tagged that came down through the dam. And you can see, for instance, this orange eel came along the North shore, came fairly straight. And this is about every minute we get a ping from this eel. Um, and you can see it kind of went over here, uh, disappeared down this side of the dam and reappeared uh, at the bottom. Um, the blue eel circled around a little bit here before moving out and then coming down probably through the ring dam. And uh, this yellow eel came down through this side of, of the dam. And of these seven eels, four survived and continued their migration out through the, the Ottawa River. And three of the seven were killed at the dam. And we know that because we heard them above the dam. And then when we detect them at the bottom, they were no longer moving or they were just drifting very, very slowly. Um, and so that's, that's the sort of challenge that these eels face as they're coming through the dam. Mm -hmm. um, when I said that nothing was being done, the, the good news story here is this one intake channel, one of the five turbines uh, a couple of years ago was recently rebuilt and reinstalled. And when they did that, uh, Energy Ottawa or Hydro Ottawa, actually they're now called Portage Power, mm -hmm. um, but they actually installed a screen in front of that dam that would keep eels from being sucked into the turbine. And on top of that screen and on the side, they introduced these bypass channels, which are basically water slides that eels can, uh, you know, basically go down to get around the turbine safely. So now those eels have two different safe passage routes around this dam. There's still other turbines that are running that are killing eels, but that's the kind of improvement that we can make and mm -hmm. that we need to make each time we go and renovate one of these dams to get eels safely around the dam. So that's uh, you know, a good step forward and is one of the positive stories from an eel conservation perspective. 
No, turbines are a huge risk, but someone I can, I, I miss their name, but um, they're asking about sharks. Yeah. Um, are sharks big predators? Who are big predators besides turbines? Who are yeah. the big predators that are after eels? Uh, seals would be as well. Um, mm -hmm. When they're young, a lot of other fish would eat an eel. Um, striped bass eat a lot of eels in uh, the St. Lawrence River, but they wouldn't eat a big adult eel. So the eels leaving the Ottawa River, again, are these like five to 10 pound or, or bigger uh, meter long female eels. And there's not really many fish until you get to the ocean that are going to be able to eat them. Um, birds of prey would eat them as well. But again, at that size, even an eagle, that's probably too big of a fish for an eel to, an eagle to take. Mm -hmm. um, so humans, sharks and seagull, seals would probably be the biggest uh, predators on big eels. There's probably, you know, a big bluefin tuna, some of those other big marine uh, species might be able to eat them as well. Um, but, you know, those populations had always been able to, they sort of expect a natural background uh, mortality from predators like that. Um, they didn't evolve to deal with those turbine mortalities. Uh, and there is still some fishing mortality. So um, again, you know, where these eel populations are abundant in the East Coast, there's some fisheries that exist that, that probably aren't a big issue. And it's probably okay for those, those fisheries to keep harvesting eels. Um, one challenge though is on the St. Lawrence River, there's a fishery for these big silver eels. And um, they harvest, of their harvest, uh, of all the eels that leave Ontario, about 10% of them are still being caught in those nets on the St. Lawrence River uh, downstream of Quebec City. Mm. They've reduced that fishery because of the challenges that eels are fishing. So if we went back uh, 10 or 15 years, probably about 20% of these eels would be harvested. Uh, so they've reduced that to 10%. But given how badly Ontario's eels are doing, they're, you know, it's really uh, not acceptable that we continue to fish, harvest, and consume uh, this endangered population of American eel, especially because these are the big females that are so important to that global population. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to let you jump to your, your, we've got a couple of big hard hitting questions to ask you at the end. So I'm going to let yeah. you get to your uh, last so the, lab. The last neat study that we did was this catch and release study. And we actually went to a lab on the East Coast, the Makotak uh, hatchery. And we uh, put hooks in eels and kept them in a tank for a long time to see how they would do. Because people do sometimes catch eels by mistake when they're uh, catching and releasing them. And we wanted to find out you know, how do eels do uh, after they've gone through this? Uh, do they recover from their injuries? And is it better to pull the hook out or just to cut the line and let eels go? And the good news is eels are incredibly tough and hardy. And we put together this little pamphlet to let people know what to do if you catch an eel. And what we found out was that of, of the eels that we tagged, and I think it was about 150, uh, every one of them survived after a week. Mm. Um, and even 90% of them after seven days really had no sign that they'd ever been hooked, that they really didn't have any injuries associated with that. So they did very well. What's even more amazing is that of the eels that we had hooked in their lips, within seven days not, and had cut the line, 95% of them had shed that hook within oh. seven days all by themselves. And the ones that we hooked deeper in the back of their tongue, even then 72% of them had shed their, their hooks by the end of the day. So if you happen to catch an eel, if you're fishing and you don't want to handle it or you don't know how to handle it, don't be afraid to cut the line as close to the hook as possible and let that eel go. And almost certainly it will do okay. Uh, these are tough, tough fish. Tough animals, yeah. It, it takes a giant hydropower turbine to really uh, harm these eels. They're uh, incredibly tough and resilient compared to many other fish. <laughs> or a shark. Yeah, exactly. An eel shark or a harvester. Uh, a turbine, a shark or a harvester is about all, right. all that's going to do it. We have some questions here. And the first one is, these youth now really love these ears. There's a lot of when you were talking about them hidden by turbines, there's a lot of that makes me really sad. I really don't makes like me that. sad too. Yeah. Yeah. So they're wondering, what can they do as youth? What can yeah. they do to, to make companies change change their ways and really consider these turbine bypasses and that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, you know, spread the word, help other people who see eels and think they're scary or think they're ugly. Uh, let people know that these eels are important, that they are uh, really need animals and that they need help. Um, you know, it's uh, if you do catch an eel, let it go. You know, if you see an eel, uh, don't, don't bother it. 
uh, pick it up if you want to, if you catch it in a net, you know, feel free to have a look because they're not harmed that easily, but make sure you get it back in the water. Um, it's probably not a good idea to eat eels right now because we're, uh, you know, they're just not being managed as well as they could be. Um, and it would be great to get to a point where we could sustainably harvest and eat eels. Um, if you really want to do something, you need to work with your parents to talk to our politicians and our power producers, our hydropower producers, and let them know that they need to do more about these turbines. That's really the key issue that we can do more about. And I guess about harvesting eels if that's not being done sustainably. Um, but that's, you know, it's hard because as a kid, you don't really have a chance to talk to a dam operator uh, or to a politician. So that's a hard thing for you to do. Uh, really, the best thing you can do is encourage other people around you to care about and conserve eels and, and hope that and, you know, that word will get back to those people who make these decisions. Awesome. Okay, we've got a couple seconds here, a couple minutes. I want to, but I do want a chance if there's anyone who has a question to wave their hand and we will get, we'll look for you to ask your question of our scientists. Oh, mm -hmm. Malik. All right, I'm going to unmute you. You go ahead there, dude. Oh, no, you might have to unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's see. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you got muted again. Do it again. There you go. We got gotcha. you. Go ahead. What's your question? So one of my questions was, um, um, can eels spread diseases and how many are left in the wild? Well, we don't know how many are left in the wild. We have guesses, you know, for the Ottawa River, Lake Ontario, uh, in terms of how many might leave a year. So we think in the Ottawa River, there might be a few thousand at most adults leaving every year. And historically, there would have been 400,000 adults leaving every year. Um, eels cannot spread diseases to humans. Uh, they're, you know, that's one nice thing about fish. We're just so different from fish that we don't get diseases from them. Um, but eels can spread diseases to each other uh, or parasites. Uh, and so actually that did happen, unfortunately. There's, they have a swim bladder parasite. So fish have like a balloon inside them called a swim bladder that lets them uh, not sink and not float. It lets them maintain uh, their weight in the water so that they can uh, sort of be neutral in terms of how much they sink or float. And uh, unfortunately the eels on the East Coast have this swim bladder parasite. And uh, one of the power companies took a bunch and introduced them into Lake Ontario to try to um, offset the harm that those turbines had done. And unfortunately, they brought that parasite. They tried to screen them for that parasite and make sure they didn't have any, but some ended up having it. And they transferred that parasite now to the eels in Lake Ontario. So now Lake Ontario eels deal with that parasite as well. So they can spread diseases to each other, but not to us. Oh, awesome. All right, Grace is next and then Bilal. Wait, I have something else. No. Oh, we're just gonna, we're gonna, we only, we're already over. So unfortunately we're gonna have to move on to the next student, but if there's time at the end, we'll get back to you. But I think it's gonna be Grace and then Bilal. All right, I'm Grace. Gonna, if eels make sound, what does their sound sound like? I've never heard an eel make a sound. You know, most fish that make sounds don't do it with their throats. They do it by grinding different structures. So a catfish you might hear go, rrr, rrr, and it's because they have a little bony uh, place inside their fin with a bunch of teeth on it. Uh, and they grind that against another one. And basically just like a cricket rubbing its legs together to make a sound, a chirp sound, those catfish can make a, a grunt sound like that. Um, there's other fish that have uh, teeth in their throat that they grind together to make sort of uh, a drumming sound, but I don't think eels make sounds. What? That's so cool with the mm -hmm. I'm going to have to listen more when I'm out. Thank you, Grace, for that mm -hmm. awesome question. That's such a good one. All right, Bilal, over to you. Mm -hmm. How long do eels grow up for? How long do they live for? Uh, the Female eels that live far inland uh, typically live to be about 20 years old. Um, we think they might live up to 40 years old, some individuals. Um, and then the male eels typically live only five to seven years. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's probably better for them. They want to live long enough to get big. They get bigger every year. They don't stop growing like humans do, uh, but they want to get big as quickly as possible and then go and, and uh, spawn. Awesome. Okay, Nuria, I think we have time for one last question. Would you like to take it, Nuria? 
You're already unmuted. Okay. Okay. Can, can eels produce electricity? I'm sorry, can they produce what? I think electricity. I think electricity. Can I eels see. produce electricity? No, not American eels. Uh, you you might be thinking about a, uh, electric eels, which is a, a similar looking but not closely related species. That is freshwater only. They don't go out to the ocean to spawn, and they live down in the Amazon River. And they can produce uh, quite a bit of electricity. They use it to stun other fish, to stun their prey, and then eat them. But the eels that we have here in Canada uh, cannot produce electricity. Oh, that's so cool. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could talk about this for a long time. There are so many questions and so many great questions. And mm -hmm. I feel like I've learned a ton about eels and really about endangered species and taking care of, you know, working with our parents and our teachers and our communities and our industry to, to help save some of these animals so that their populations don't continue to, to dwindle. Um, uh, Marge had an amazing question. I think it would be the, I know we're already a little bit over, but I would love for you to, to answer this one. And it was like, all these kids are here and they're passionate about eels. They're passionate about wildlife and endangered species. You're a scientist. What, how do you, how do they get into science? How do they make something of this that is bigger than maybe just today? If they feel this is their passion and they want to do this for their, how, how do you, how should they best do that? Yeah, so I was really lucky as a kid because I didn't really like school and uh, my school didn't really give me a lot of chances to study this sort of thing. Uh, but I had a lot of hobbies that did. So I like to really play outside, play in streams. Uh, I joined a kids uh, naturalist club. So a lot of the local field naturalist clubs have, um, have organizations for kids. And I got to go out uh, every Saturday morning, we would either go for a hike in the woods, or we would have a talk like this every, you know, one week, we'd have a talk. Uh, the next week, we'd go for a hike. And I learned a lot about natural history and nature that way. Uh, I was also in scouts, so got to spend a lot of time outside that way and uh, also learn about ecosystems and ecology. Uh, so you really have to look for uh, clubs and activities and organizations like that outside of school unless you're lucky and you go to a school that has really good outdoor education programs. And I hope that you have that. And I hope you have good teachers that get you outside and teach you about nature. Um, mine didn't, but I found another way to do that instead. Well, I think Marge here and Madame Yinka, who is their their students are joining us today from Ghana. And I just want to thank all of you for coming on uh, with great teachers like this who are setting wonderful examples about joining these. I'm sure they're getting outdoors and exploring. Absolutely, nature. absolutely. Wonderful. It's, great. it's been really great. Thank you for having us. And yes, we have a lot to go back to school and discuss after this. So thank you so much. Great. Thank you for joining. Thank Wonderful. You. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ghana. Thank you, Ottawa. And thank you, Ontario. Everyone in Ontario, everyone joining us from Alberta, from wherever you are on the planet. Thank you for celebrating or marking Endangered Species Day. We hope you've learned some about this species and it'll inspire you to learn more about other species that might be endangered and what you can do to help them. So thank you for joining us, Nick, and all of your knowledge and sharing. I hope you all have a wonderful day and we'll see you again soon at another Canadian Wildlife Federation event. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Have a great day. Bye.